All right, without further ado, let me uh, move on to the introduction. It is my absolute privilege, and I don't think I've had any greater privilege in any previous introduction, to introduce my brother, my blood brother, my brother in Christ, uh, Sanjay Poonin. And I'll just give a few words of introduction uh, for him. Probably the least important fact about him, and I'll repeat that, the least important fact as he would say to me, he, he made sure to tell me to make sure this was not glamorous in terms of introduction, is the fact that he is the CEO of a Silicon Valley company named Cohesity. And the reason that's the least important fact is because he would much rather be known as a child of God and a servant of God and a brother in Christ and one that is committed to building the local body of Christ. He works together closely with me in building our local uh, body of Christ here in our church, uh, New Covenant Christian Fellowship in San Jose. And when I think about Sanjay, I'll just share a couple of things that come to mind that maybe many of you don't know about him because you have heard of him as a public figure, as, uh, as a corporate executive, maybe as a son of Zach Boonin. Uh, and many, many of you have heard of him in an uh, extended CFC context as well. Uh, but Sanjay stands out. The word, verse to me that embodies Sanjay to me is Philippians 2 verse 3. And that is regard others as more important than yourselves. And I, I can't think of another person that very counterintuitively embodies that more so than Sanjay in terms of treating every single person. Imagine he is the CEO of a large company. Uh, thousands of people reporting to him, many people, he's a father at home, he's active in ministry here at the church. But in all of these situations, and many, and certainly many people come to him and treat him with a lot more respect, but in all of these situations, I have seen him. He is an oldest brother to all of his siblings as well. But even in those family situations in the extended family, he has always treated me and everyone else as more important than himself. And that really speaks to his humility. And he is a great example of that. And the other two qualities that I mentioned is uh, he is one of the greatest examples of being a peacemaker. And a peacemaker is one that first sets peace in their own conscience between them and God. And Sanjay is one that is quick when he sees something wrong between him and God, or he's convicted of something from a word he hears to set it right between him and God. And then beyond that, to bring peace with uh, other human beings where uh, there might be perceived conflict. And then the last thing I'll mention is that he's extremely generous, not just with his money, but with his time. And Proverbs 11.25 says, a generous man will be prosperous, and the man who waters others will himself be watered. And all of us, and, and not all of us may, be, may have a lot of money, but all of us have plenty of time. And I think that Sanjay is an amazing example of one who is generous, with this time and an example to me and an example to all of us, how we can be generous with our time in spending time with loved ones, with brothers and sisters, encouraging ones in need. And in that sense, he is a trailblazing example. And of course, as you all know, uh, and you may have heard, he is a dynamic, inspirational leader in the workplace, um, a trailblazing example of servant leadership and has spoken in uh, many ways, inspiring others to follow his example. And to me personally, he has been a role model, for personally, professionally, as well as spiritually. So without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure and joy to introduce to you Sanjay Poonan. Take it away, Sanjay. Thank you, my brother Sunil. And um, I'm honored and humbled. Um, none of the words that you said I deserve. <clears throat> um, I will tell you, we both owe a lot of that to the Lord, clearly, first off, but I will give my mother a lot of credit. Um, she is my hero in my life, and I think a lot of the humility us boys have learned um, comes from the example we saw of her at home, uh, her from her, I was not born at the time, but my st stories I heard about her serving in a leprosy mission hospital, and also um, the examples I saw of her growing up, of treating other people, there was no fame or fortune 
um, desire in her or desire to treat people in the church setting or in society or in our neighborhood or in our school. Her friends were the people who were the lowly people who served the Lord. And it was no difference. In fact, it, the case was most often that the people who are rich and famous did not want to serve the Lord. It's not the fact that God cannot use rich and famous people, but most often, um, as we see in the scriptures, those who love money, uh, their God is not, uh, you know, the God is mammon. So we're very grateful for examples, and my hope is during the course of this discussion um, and questions that we answer, I can be a small encouragement to you like my mother's been to me, um, I apologize, my voice is a little hoarse. I'm getting over a cough and a cold, but God will give me grace. Thank you for your prayers. Um, and what I'd like to do today is encourage, especially the young people. Um, it's a tremendous blessing. I'm honored and humbled uh, to have several hundred people on the Zoom, and I think people on YouTube too. And I hope for especially those of you who are in your 20s and your 30s, um, and especially in the workplace, some are called to be in full-time ministry, like my dad, my dad supported himself, but he was working for the Lord full time when he left the Navy. Before that, he was in the Navy. But 98% of us, maybe 99%, maybe all of us will have a job in the workplace. In fact, that's what the disciples had. A few of them quit that job maybe and was supported. But Paul was a tent maker. Peter was a fisherman. Um, Daniel, Job, Joseph all had jobs. But they found a way to serve the Lord in a way that was remarkable and very inspirational to me. And what I would like to do is just share with you a few of those examples that have been examples in the, the Bible, what has taught me about the, their story, and then use a few of those principles uh, for the first 30, 45 minutes of our discussion. And then we can also take some questions that I think Brother Matthew and Sunil are going to facilitate. There are not many examples in the Bible of people who were in the workplace uh, and also people of, of integrity who fear the Lord. But there are a few that really stand out because most often you see them as prophets or you see them as preachers. Uh, we could go back to some of the first examples in the Old Testament. And to me, Joseph is the first example of an incredible man who is probably like many of you here in watching this, in that age group that Joseph was. And you know, for those of you who are finishing high school, going into college, they tell you your 20s is the most formative years of your life. That first job that you take is the most important because it's going to set you up for whatever you do next. You work so hard in college to get that first job. I don't know if you all know what Joseph was doing in his 20s. Almost his entire 20s. He was in jail. It's a remarkable thing to think about that. Um, and when I think about what could have been going on in his life, I mean, obviously he was sold into slavery and he was in jail for standing up for integrity when, you know, he could have sinned, done something. We all know what happened is the temptation with part of his wife. Maybe no one would have seen him, but God would have seen it. But for conviction, he stood up. In, in, in private, where no one was watching, got sent to jail, thought he was going to get taken out of jail because he hoped that someone would remember him. Even that person forgot about him. He was in jail probably for twice as long as maybe expected. But because of his faithfulness uh, to stand true to God, when everybody else was compromising, he stood true to God with conviction. God put him to the place where he was the number two person in the number one country in the world. So whatever country you think is the leading country today in the world, it doesn't matter. Imagine you were the number two person in that country. And you were there for a purpose. The purpose was not to make money. Ultimately, his purpose was to save his people. Because we know there was harvest and then there was famine. And Joseph was able to rescue his family. And maybe that entire clan, you know, Jacob and all that, his children would have died had it not been for Joseph rescuing that family. Of course, they were able to come out later on from Egypt. But the impact of Joseph has had a tremendous, um, you know, has, has strung to my life many times. I think about what he was doing in his 20s and how he served God 
again, what wisdom God gave him through his 20s into his 30s, and what would he have uh, done in a particular situation? How did God give him wisdom over and over again? Before I get to Daniel, another example. Let me cover another example in the Old, Test Old Testament. Job. Imagine that you had, not that any of this matters in today's day and age, but imagine that you had everything that you needed. Okay, he was, if you look at all of the possessions of Job, it counts cattle and, you know, obviously number of children. And today, if you count all of that, it's probably like cars and houses and whatever have you. So in worldly material terms, God had blessed him. But then one day, all of that disappeared. And he gets covered with boils. He's sent out to the city. And even his wife basically says, you should curse God and die. So everybody's rejected him. And even these people who are so-called Christian friends of his, or godly friends of his, people who um, were supposedly supposed to come and help him, they were not really comforting him. And through all of that, he finds an even closer relationship with God. Now, at the end of the story, God restores much of that. But we know in the New Testament, many people, you know, were sent to the stake to, to be burned, and God didn't rescue them. And our evidence of God's blessing isn't in the New Testament material anymore. The point is through our uh, life's journeys where we go through ups and downs, all of us will have valleys and we will have mountaintops. The key is to find God in the valleys. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, my, um, you may think when you look at my career and things of those times, it's up and to the right, but I will tell you that my walk with the Lord has been the closest when I have had to go through points in life where it felt like a valley. Maybe there was something that was besetting me, was really seeking to bring me down, or maybe there was a time when I wasn't um, close to the Lord. As many of you knew, I grew up as um, <clears throat> the son of Zach Poonin. And for many years, I resented that. Um, or maybe till I was 18. I was, because I was under the, this sort of bright flashlight of everybody watching every move I made. In the church, people wanting to know if I moved to the left or the right, why was he doing this? And many of my brothers were probably in the same way. I see many of you smiling and laughing on Zoom. You may know what it's like if you are a pastor's, a preacher's son. Imagine the scrutiny you're under. So I resented that. I wanted to be not known as Zach Moonen's son. I wanted to be my own person who could do what I want to do. Not, I don't think I had a desire to be a prodigal son, but I just didn't want the, the light and the scrutiny. Um, when the Lord opened this door for me to get a scholarship to come as an immigrant here to this country, um, for the first few years, I was extremely lonely. I was homesick because, oh my gosh, now I was so far away. No one at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, where I came to, had never been to New Hampshire. For those of you who are in New England, in the northeast part of the United States, dialed into the Zoom, you know how cold it is in the Boston area. It's remarkably different from Bangalore. I was homesick. I was lonely. And then I wanted to be Zach Poon and Son because I wanted to be back at home. How remarkable things had changed. But when I was so far away from home, 10,000 miles, missing my family, I felt a little bit like what Joseph or Job or Daniel, many of these folks who were away from their families must have fed. And I said, now I had to experience God for myself. Many of you were at the previous Zoom session, which Brother Sunil spoke at mostly towards younger teenagers and 20-something. But he said something that struck me even as an older person. He said, God has no grandchildren. He only has children. Okay, so what does that mean to me? Well, okay, Zach Poonin is a son of the Lord. I don't get to be a grandchild of Jesus just because I'm the son of Zach Poonin. God has no grandchildren. I have to enter that proverbial kingdom through the eye of the needle myself. And I found that for myself in my late teenagers and my 20-somethings when all of a sudden, I had to enter the kingdom not on the coattails of Zach Poonin because I committed my life to Jesus because I stood up as my own. When no one was watching, I had to commit my life I'd been baptized, but I had to rededicate my life in my 20s. And that for me was a remarkable, I had to probably leave home 
uh, experienced the, the homesickness, the loneliness, away from my family. Many of you who have come to the United States have come here or have left home in your late, mid to late 20s. So for me, all of these examples of what I saw in the Old Testament had a very formative experience in my life as I now let's get to Daniel. Daniel's one of my greatest heroes. Daniel um, uh, was, you know, think of him in, in his late teenage years. In fact, many times I've talked about the subject, I've called it Dare to Be a Daniel. Um, imagine you're in your 18, sort of similar age to when I came to this country. Um, and you're offered, you know, food and you have a conviction that you're not going to eat the food that's offered to idols. You're not going to drink the wine. Um, you're instead going to eat vegetables and drink water. And the end of that first part, there's so many aspects of Daniel that are so inspiring. But the part of the first part of that story in Daniel 1 and 2 that's so remarkable is they give him a test at the end of the, the you know, that first sequence uh, of his being selected. And it says he's, I don't know, three or five or seven times smarter than everybody else. And I got to tell you, I have always been inspired by people who serve the Lord. I had examples in my growing up years in Bangalore of brothers who would come to the meetings on a Wednesday night, even though they had a major exam the next day. Uh, or they'd come on a Sunday um, for the meeting, and I knew they had a major exam on Monday. And in their own small way, they were trying to say, Lord, I'm going to prioritize you first. And I've always prayed, Lord, if I'm going to be faithful to you like Daniel, um, I'm not going to pray, make me seven or ten times smarter than everybody else, but maybe me, make me seven or ten times more productive. And many of us, when we face challenges in the workplace, many of the things that we face are puzzles. Should we do this? Should we do that? It's a decision in front of us. Uh, or we have a problem that's being asked by our manager to get solved. Imagine if what it takes you one hour to solve, it takes everybody else 10 hours to solve because God's given you that supernatural power and that wisdom. Imagine, you know, the same wisdom that allowed Daniel to discover a dream. Imagine being asked by your boss, I had a dream yesterday. If you don't tell me what that dream was, I'll put you in jail. I mean, that's an impossible request. But that's in, in some senses what the assignment Daniel was given. And God gave him an incredible amount of wisdom. And that's the wisdom I prayed for every day when I face a puzzle at work. Lord, give me the wisdom. Give me the productivity of Daniel. I'm going to honor you. 1 Samuel 2.30, those who honor you, I will honor. And hold on to that, brothers and sisters, when you're faced in the workplace with challenges. And I'm here, the God of Daniel is still true today. Some of the things may not be, you may not get the promotion, but there's many times where somehow I'm working on a particular project and there's a breakthrough, uh, or there's an idea that comes through, and that's an answer to prayer. And then go back and say, Lord, thank you. I was faithful to you. Um, thank you for giving me that extra piece of wisdom. And then the amazing part of the Daniel story, a few times during this discussion today, I'm going to flash a few screens up so you can see pictures too, in addition to um, my words. The beautiful aspect of this picture, which is Daniel's three friends. We know their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why is Daniel not in this picture? So Daniel was not there. Maybe he was on a business trip. In this part of the story, we don't hear about Daniel. Daniel's gone, but his conviction and his desire to be faithful had inspired these three men. So often, brothers and sisters, you will be an inspiration to those who are younger than you by simply following the Lord. And here, now they are tested on their own without Daniel now. And whatever that temptation is today in terms of bowing down to an idol, we're all going to be faced this. And all of our surrounding friends, all the other Jewish brothers of his were all bowing down. This is an example to me of Christians who are compromising left, right, and center today in the workplace. And you, three of you who are Christians, brothers and sisters, you stand. Um, for conviction while everybody else is compromising. And you get thrown into the fire like these three men did. You get persecuted in the workplace 
But there in the middle of that fire, they, they meet Jesus, as we know, the Son of God. And the amazing thing about this fire, I've shared this a number of times, it's worth repeating again, though. It, they were bound with ropes and sent into the fire, it says in the story. Yet when they came out of the fire, they smelt their hands and there was no smell of um, fire on their hair of their hands, it says. But their ropes were burned away. How is that possible? Ropes and hair are made of the same material. The ropes burned away, yet their, their skin did not even smell of fire. To me, that's an incredible uh, inspiration and a blessing. And a um, to me, when the Lord takes us to a trial, imagine to be freed of everything that's binding us. That's what ropes are. It binds us here to this earth. But at the same time, we're not going to be touched at all. And you can hold on to that promise, brothers and sisters. If there's something that's binding you, maybe it's discouragement, maybe it's something else, God will free you from that in the midst of your trial. Yet, no one will be able to touch you uh, on this earth. Even if they take your life, that's the worst case. None of us have had that happen. We're here on this Zoom call. None of us have been killed so far. But maybe down the road, there will be persecution, like the first century Christians. When this happened to many of the first century Christians, they didn't survive this. They died and they went to heaven. So even in the worst case, if God takes us to heaven, it's in a beautiful picture uh, of how you can come through the fire and still be uh, sanctified even further. This picture is a painting that my dad and mom gave me. Um, it's in my office, right above my desk here, where my computer is. And here is Daniel, probably much older, maybe in his 70s, maybe in his 80s. My dad is 84, so maybe he's about that age now. So he's been faithful to God many decades. Um, and now, of course, and the beautiful thing about Daniel's story is he's actually the number two person, like Joseph, in three different administrations. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, and Darius. Think about this. Imagine if you were in a government and three different presidents or prime ministers came to office. Democrat, Republican, Democrat, or maybe... I don't know, BJP, Congress, BJP, whatever have you. And in every one of those administrations, you're still the number two person because they said, I don't care about what political affiliations, I want this person, he's the best person to do the job. Or three different CEOs or three different leaders come and they all want, always want Daniel because he's the best person for the job. That was Daniel over and over again. But in his this time, everyone is, is trying to trap him. They trap him because he's faithful and prays in public, not in secret. He prays with his windows open. Another good example of not being ashamed of his faith. Thrown into the lion's den and we know the rest of the story. Now I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, again, like the Christians of the first century, the lion's mouth was not closed in the first century. Many of them got eaten. So the point of the story is not that when we enter a situation, maybe in the future, the lion's den may be, the lions might open their mouth. But the point of the matter, brothers and sisters, is we can be faithful. And that is what inspires me about these three examples. And there's many more in the Old Testament. There's not as many in the New Testament that we see who were examples of Christians in the workplace. But I will tell you the key thing I take away from those three or four I shared with you is be a Christian of conviction in the midst of Christians who are compromising left, right, and center. And if you work through the workplace, I'm not even talking about non-Christians. Non-Christians are compromising all over the place. Okay, they don't have a fear of God often to understand. But it's sad when Christians, so-called Christians, are compromising. And that's what we should all encourage each other to be a Daniel, to be a Joseph, that in the midst of compromise, we stand up for God. And that what we hear on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening on our Bible study, we get to live at work. That's the most important thing. Many of us have heard at these types of sessions. Church is not about Sunday morning. It's about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay, real life starts on Monday morning when you go to work. And you ask yourself, how are you going to live now? And, and, and you hear something that guides you. One of the things that have blessed me tremendously about these uh, daily devotionals. Many of you know the daily devotionals, and I'm very grateful to the CFC team that puts that together. For those of you brothers who put that together, you know, that is my inspiration every morning. I drive to work. It's a half an hour commute. Uh, I turn on the daily devotional, and it blesses me. It's uh, Now my kids, they're able to go to school. 
It takes about 15, 20 minutes. It blesses them. But some small word is going to come to you from that daily devotional or what you heard that Sunday that's going to, to guide you and inspire you to be a person of conviction. Okay, let's fast forward a little bit to the modern 20th century and look at some examples of people who are similarly people of conviction. Uh, and I like to use these because these are good examples uh, of people we can follow who may not have been always, you know, people in the workplace, but were people of conviction. George Mueller, many of you know the story. To me, he's an incredible person of <clears throat> faith who believed the impossible. And many times in the workplace, I pray, Lord, you know, if it's your will, make the impossible possible. Um, sometimes those prayers work out. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they take a year to work out. I'm working on a deal that might take a long time to work through. There's this problem that is taking twice as long. Lord, make the impossible possible. Imagine that you're taking care of orphans, as he did. There is no food on the table, no milk on the table. And all these orphans are getting together and you say, let's pray in faith that there's going to be food, but there's no food on the table. You pray in the food for, for, for food. And just as you finish saying amen at the end of the prayer, the doorbell rings and there's a baker whose you know, van is broken down and there's your bread. And similarly, the milk van shows up. That's probably many times when he didn't get answered to prayer, but we heard about the story where God answered prayer. And whether he answered the prayer and provided his bread of man, the fact of the matter was that here was a man who example after example in the late 19th century was an example of perseverance through faith. Those of you younger men who um, love athletics, Eric Little, you all heard about that story. Um, <clears throat> there was a movie about this also created called Chariots of Fire. Um, Eric Little was an amazing man. Imagine you're 18. Okay, and I like to paint these pictures because many of you are probably in that age and you're an athlete or you're really good. And, and he was so good, he could run, win the 100 meters for his country, which was England. Um, and as many of you know, athletes, you have a window of time, 18 to 22, when you're at the peak. And Olympics only happen once every four years. Turns out the heats, the heat for the 100 meters is on uh, a Sunday. He has a conviction he's not going to run on a Sunday. He goes to his coach and says, coach, I'm not going to run the 100 meters now. And he says, the coach is laughing at him. Are you kidding me? How could you do this? You're representing the country. Why don't you go to church on a Saturday and then run on a Sunday? Um, and he is resolute about his conviction. Why? I mean, your God can, you can worship your God on Saturday too. Anyway, he misses the heat. Um, fortunately, the English team accommodates him in the 400 meters one of the other English athletes gives up this spot. He's never run the 400 meters. He gets the final um, you know, starting blocks of the 400 meters, and this American athlete comes to him with a piece of paper and gives him this piece of paper. On the piece of paper is this verse, 1 Samuel 2.30. Those who honor God, those who honor me, I will honor. It's a beautiful verse. I talked about it earlier. Um, this, The conviction of Eric Little had, had an impact on this other um, athlete who was also a Christian running, he turns out he wins the 400 meters. He goes on, he could have won another Olympics, but he goes on to be a missionary in China. And as the story goes later on, he held races for many of the prisoners. He was in prison uh, in China as a missionary in his later years. He would hold races for many of the folks uh, in the prison that he was on a Sunday. So he wasn't a legalist about that. He maybe, maybe in his later years, he felt it's totally okay for me to serve the Lord. I don't have a conviction to run myself, but I'm going to serve you. And if I'm going to run races in the prison here on a Sunday, that's totally okay. He didn't live very long. He died of cancer, brain cancer at 43 years old. Amazing example of someone. Okay, God doesn't just use brothers. He uses sisters too. Amy Carmichael, an incredible woman of God who served in India, my home country, in the early 20th century. And many of the folks who were involved in the orphanages and have seen the impact she had in India, tremendous service of humility and servant leadership. So there's examples and examples after of this kind, brothers and sisters, that are incredible examples to me. Um, and these were the types of stories 
Uh, in Psalms, it says, I'll keep the, make the godly my heroes. So the first thing I would encourage each of you to do is pick a godly example that you can personalize. Personalize, study their example, because there are other examples today, certainly in the world, but the God's given us the Bible for a reason, and there are examples. I gave you a few, some who were in the Bible, some who were not. Read their biographies. If they are certainly in the Bible, you get to read them. But if they're not, um, they've lived more recently, read their biographies and ask yourself, how can I emulate their life in their godly example? To me, it was tremendously impactful because many of these stories, um, you know, helped me in my early years. Um, and then ask yourself, Lord, there's somebody in the workplace that I'd like to see as an encouragement. And God was able to give me um, often other Christians in the workplace um, because, you know, for me, many of the people I would see in the church um, were older than me. And I didn't have examples often in the country I was living in. I had to look for other Christians. Um, and I found that that just being, for example, in a Bible study with others, they may not have light on everything we have. They may not go to the same church and light and everything, but they are seeking to live uh, for the Lord, find a way by which you can plug in um, to others who are in trying to be a Christian workers and encourage them. And then somewhere in my 30s, I would say, I mean, the Lord blessed me with the now more and more success in my career. And I was starting to rise in my career at uh, SAP um, and later on at VMware. And for me, then um, I began to ask the Lord, Lord, I need to write down what are some of the goals and values and missions I have for my life. And it, maybe if I write that down, it could be an inspiration to others because I want to live by godly values. See, everybody in the world wants to live by a goal. I want to be, I don't know, some wealth level or stature level. or And none of this, the first thing that really needs to grip us is none of the things that the world has to offer us we can take to the grave and matter at all if the Lord comes. It's all going to be, um, you know, hay and rubble and going to be burned up. But that's not the value system of the world. I mean, you're surrounded and many of you are talented. You have the ability to, to pursue potentially a dream. Should we do that? There's tension. Should we pursue um, success at the workplace? So I began to write down some of my top 10, I would say, values that I wanted to live by. I did this about 20 years ago, okay, in the, I don't know, two, circa 2004, 2005. And it was as my career was starting to grow uh, in my years at, early years at SAP. And those 10 have not changed. And I want to read them to you now one at a time. Many of you have heard me talk about this before. And the good news is it's a little bit to me like the Bible. The Ten Commandments haven't changed. I mean, many of the stories haven't changed. And I go back often and refresh myself on these 10 values. And often because they're now on the internet and on YouTube, I will get LinkedIn messages from friends of mine saying, I was so inspired by principle number three or principle number four. So I'm not here to share these to you, with you like their 10 commandments or anything of those kind. They have helped me live my own life with conviction in a time when everyone's, like I said, compromising. And I share them with you a tremendous amount of humility. Like I said, my goal in life, and I'm very honored that Sunil shed that. I'll say one thing before I say what I'm about to say. You know, I grew up the oldest of four boys. And, you know, I was the oldest brother, four years, roughly about four years older than my second brother, Satosh, five years older than my uh, third brother, Sandeep, and then about nine years older than Sunil. And, you know, I like to be the boss in the home because I was the oldest. And, you know, uh, when you're young, you can beat them at sports and all that stuff. And then at some point, and that changes. And you get into your teenagers and your 20s. For those of you who are in a similar situation now, you, it's all equal when you're in your 20s. Uh, and then they get better than you at something or the other, most often sports. Um, but I will tell you, it's amazing to me now, in my 50s, I can follow their example. I genuinely mean that. And I look up to them as godly examples, all three of them. They're elders in two of them in uh, my church here in San Jose, NCCF, the other brother in Colorado. They are godly examples to me. 
uh, I'm, you know, and and to me, um, that is amazing uh, because the Lord has blessed them in their walk with the Lord. Um, and I love being able to follow them. And when we can say to others, follow me as we follow Christ, and there is no respecter of age. And I've always believed, it does, I mean, Sunil was gracious. He gave me the titles. Many of you know my education degrees. All of that means nothing. When I come into church, whether it's the physical gathering on a Sunday afternoon like we have or a Tuesday night, every one of my earthly crowns needs to be left outside the door. If I come in with any attitude that I am a CEO or I'm educated in this institution, God can't use me. Um, I need to come in as the humblest, the lowest, um, in the least in the kingdom of God, because that's the example Paul had. As he got more and more mature, he was calling himself the worst of sinners. And as you see his life, when he goes from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60, whenever, maybe in his 50s, before he was killed, he was calling himself more and more, Lord, thank you, I'm the worst of all. Of all. So um, as I share this, um, I wrote this because I wanted these values to be ones that live with me for forever. So I'm going to flash these up one at a time very quickly with you, and hopefully they can be an inspiration to all of you. We'll run through them fairly quickly. Now, you're welcome to, I mean, these are all on the web, but I would encourage you, I'm not going to go through all of the verses here, but if you can, write down some of these verses or snapshot these verses here because the verses are really... I think to me, the great inspiration. All of these are based on scriptural verses. Okay, number one, <clears throat> really important for us to realize that our life on this earth is like vapor. And our true citizenship is not at the workplace I, I'm at, SAP or VMware or COVID-19. My citizenship is in heaven. And everything that I seek to gain on this earth is going to evaporate. My life is going to evaporate too. I've had friends of mine who were in their 40s. I was in my 40s. They were in their 40s. One day they got a heart attack and died. I've had friends, and I'm now in my 50s, who suddenly heart attack and died. They're having lunch. Some folks younger than me collapsed and died. We don't know when a time when this earth is done. But if you knew that your time on earth was going to come tomorrow, okay, either the Lord was going to come back or you're... And often with cancer, we know the end of our time. Okay, there's a there are time when you get to prepare for that, but sometimes we don't. But if you knew that you had your end of your life was tomorrow, what would you do today? Would you seek to go and get that big goal or the big deal or make more money or that next big promotion? Or hopefully you're, you're set everything right and um, you're ready to meet your, your, your Savior. So i reminded by this and all of the scripture verses here at the bottom of this, talk to your citizenship is in heaven. Never forget that young brother and sister who is working in the workplace. If God gives you some reward, that's good. But nothing I've accomplished on this earth, nothing any of us accomplished on this earth matters at all. Okay, number two. Work hard in everything we do. It's really important. I often find, you know, um, Christians, some Christians, they don't work as hard. You know, Proverbs says, go to the ant, you sluggard, and learn from the ant. It, we need to be examples of the most hardworking people on this earth. Not, I mean, it doesn't have to be workaholics, but people who work really hard. When someone asks us to do something, we do it thoroughly. But then when you work hard and the Lord grants you success, fall on your knees in humility and say, Lord, help me to be faithful because at that time when people recognize me, and the Lord, people have recognized me in the last 20 years because that is the time I'm going to get proud. And that is the time I'm going to be tempted to not be faithful. Lord, give me grace at that time to be faithful. And you know what's amazing? In my own life, I have found the Lord has given me good doses of success and failure. Success and failure. And, and not failure in a way that's, you know, hopefully not failure ever for reasons of, of malpractice or things that are egregious sin or things those kinds. But, you know, sometimes I'm not picked for the next job. Or something I'm working on doesn't happen. I'm working on a deal. I lose that deal to a competitor. I mean, some, well, failure in the sense of what you might consider failure in the workplace. Um, but what I've said, said, Lord, in whether it's success or failure, I always want to be humble for you. 
Or number three, I will be a light on a hill, salt and food, keeping my Christian behavior excellent so others can glorify God. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is three of my favorite chapters, Sermon on the Mount, because you can read that over and over again. The entire Sermon on the Mount is like 15, 17 minutes. It's like they call a TED Talk is 17 minutes. If you read it end to end or imagine Jesus preaching it, it's like a 17 minute TED Talk. I'd encourage you to listen to it over and over again. And there's so many verses in that that are packed with relevance and practicality for a Christian in the workplace. One of them is this. And this picture is beautiful, right? What's a light on a hill? Very visible. Somebody who wears a, maybe a button on their, their shirt that says, Jesus saves. Praise God for those brothers and sisters. We're bold. What is salt and food? It's not visible. But you can taste it. They sit down with you. They're quiet. Maybe it's a sister who is not as bold. But when you sit down with her, you're super encouraged. You know she's godly. That's my mother, for example. But in either case, whether you're vocal and you're visible or you're more invisible, keep your Christian behavior excellent so that others can glorify God. That's Matthew 5, 3, 16 to 17. Okay, number four. So many of the decisions we have to make every day are do I turn left or right? It's not about sin or non-sin. Should I do this? Should I not do that? Which way should I go? And very often I said, Lord, fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Clearly, first off, to overcome sin. That's the most important thing. But do you think the Holy Spirit can also guide you the way they, the, the God guided Daniel and Joseph? Absolutely. And Lord, what should I say in this particular situation? Or what should I say? I'm being asked to give a speech here. And amazingly, while I'm just standing up there, something goes in my head. Say this. And somebody in the audience is blessed. That was from the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for giving me that wisdom to say exactly that word. And it was nothing to do about being a Christian or godliness. It was about some way in which I could think of a metaphor or an example. And every time someone comes up to you and says, wow, what you said there was the right thing we needed to hear about uh, in this particular situation. Go and give, say, Lord, thank you. That was the Holy Spirit giving me wisdom. Uh, and, and most often, it's about how we speak and how we act. Often in the workplace, people are judged by how we speak and how we act. Number five, generosity. How should we deal with generosity? Most often, <clears throat> people talk about this in the context of money. You got to give money. You got to give money. You got to give money. And the Christian the churches are filled with, you must tithe. And if you don't tithe, God's not going to bless you in the workplace. Um, I don't believe that at all. Um, certainly, you know, if God gives, given you more of, of treasure, I call time, talent, and treasure, the three T's that we can give treasure is money. Use it and do it in confidence. Do it in a way that no one knows about. Don't do it in a way where everyone hears about it. So many people want to be philanthropists in a big way. Do it in a way where no one hears about it. And if you're, you, if somebody knows that it's you, please ask them to keep it confidential. That's related to the treasure. It's money. Where so much about money giving is about what people want to get a name for. But I will tell you something that all of you can give. Your time and your talent. Okay? That time, all of us have. Talent, all of us have different degrees of it. You might be gifted in, in music like the brothers who led this morning. Give up that talent to the Lord and be generous. And I will tell you, the Lord will reward you. One of those places will be like the wisdom of Daniel to discover dreams and so on. Number six, this is a tough one. How could we be ambitious in the workplace um, and ambitious to get to the top, the top of where it is? You know, many of the people who knew my dad in the Navy later on, I would meet people who were classmates of my dad in the Navy or who were retired, you would tell me, I don't know why your dad left the Navy. Had he stayed in the Navy, he would have been the Admiral of the Navy. Okay. And I always ask myself, my dad was, he could have been ambitious and could have been the Admiral of the Navy. I'm sure when he was in the Navy, he wanted to be that. There was nothing wrong with that. He chose to leave that and serve the Lord. But is it wrong if you're in the Navy or if in my workplace and God's given you the gift uh, for you to rise? I'm now the CEO of my company. I couldn't do that without any ambition. The point here is selfish ambition. If I'm doing it purely for myself, and often selfish ambition is manifest in the workplace where people climb over each other. And the workplace is filled with people who are political, 
who want to step over each other to get to the top um, or undermine others because in undermining somebody else, you're able to say that I'm better. That's the example. Now, the same time if the Lord doesn't take you to the top, that's totally okay. Your real ambition should be to serve the Lord. And I will tell you, if I wasn't the CEO of Cohesity, the bigger aspect of what I want to be by motivated by every day is, Lord, is am I on fire for you? First, that's my personal life. Is my married life, Kathy and me, are we on fire for you? Then the family life, Sophia, Alex, Jason, my children, are they on fire for you? That's the personal context. It means nothing if I'm successful at cohesity, if my family's not on fire for you. I better quit my job and, and handle my family matters rather than aspire to anything in the workplace. And it's sad often when people have chased all of their ambitions in the workplace and their family has no time, they have no time for their family. Or in church, how can I serve the Lord? I may not be able to do everything because sometimes I've got to travel for business, but where is my heart? Okay, where your heart is, um, there is also where your love will be. That's why you cannot love God and love mammon. You have to set yourself on loving God. Now, in the context of that, if the Lord allows you with the pursuit of a goal to get to a particular um, career, God bless you for that but do nothing out of selfish ambition. Number seven, I people, uh, the brother Matthew asked me, how do you want to be introduced for this meeting? And I said, I want to be called an aspiring servant leader. I always feel like that's my goal. Lord, make me more and more a servant leader. Um, and because I'm going to show you a picture in a second, uh, the picture that I've shown, in fact, in the workplace and physically at work. Many of these, these top 10 I don't share in the workplace because I'm not trying to, you know, make my, my role at a company like a pastor's role where I'm preaching to people. But I talk about being a servant leader in the workplace. Why? It's super important for people to know that I'm not the CEO bird sitting at the top of a tree. I'll show you a picture in a second. But part of the reason is because I'm inspired by this person. This is the picture of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. So if that is the person I serve, this shouldn't be the picture of how I manage the workplace. So in, at Cohesity, I'm at the top here. And most often, this is a picture of how people look at the workplace. That poor bird that's sitting at the, the lowest leaf level, as they call it, the organization. Maybe they call them individual contributors. Okay, then there's a manager, then there's a director, then there's a VP, then there's a CEO often. often all the, the individual contributor sees when they look up is bird poop coming down them. You go do this. It's a command and control style of how the people lead. This is the army. In the army, it's command and control. You better told, get told what to do. I often tell my people, this is how I want to lead. Okay? Where the CEO is the bottom of the pyramid. And if you're an engineer or a sales rep, I serve you. Now, where do you think I got this from? It's a fashionable idea now. People can say it's Gandhian. I got this from this person. Jesus served that way. And if we can be a servant leader, I will tell you, it's, a, it's, it's so much better to serve and to get joy out of giving and joy out of seeing other people successful. Um, and you discover it's a lot more blessed to give um, and not to celebrate. There's so many people I find in the workplace who want to seek um, you know, glory for themselves. They have to get the honor themselves. And when they're under pe people who work for them, get recognized, they're very jealous of that. Sometimes I notice in the workplace, you have a, uh, an individual contributor, a manager, and, and then let's say you know, the director above that. When the individual contributor is visible to the director, okay, uh, individual contributor, a manager, a director, when the individual contributor gets recognized for something, the manager is jealous. And I often ask that manager, imagine you were a parent, okay? This is an example that I use in the workplace. Imagine you're a parent. And I used to run when I was young with my kids. Now many of them can race me out. But when I was young, I could beat them in a race, 50 meters, 100 meters, whatever have you. One day they got faster than me. Do you think that day when they got faster than me, I was jealous? No, I want to try and still beat them. But I'm proud of them when they get faster than me. Why is it that manager is jealous of the individual contributor 
when the individual contributor is shining in front of the director because they're insecure and they've not understood. Okay. Quite frankly, this is today, even in modern management terms, a fashionable thing to allow people at the bottom of the, of the pyramid, the people who are the individual contributors shine. Why often most of these people are the people who are serving customers and partners. So whether you believe this is fashionable or not today in modern management, okay, I will tell you, it's biblical. And when you serve God and become a servant leader, not seeking your own glory, but encouraging those around you constantly. You know, when I was, uh, when, I, when we would read bedtime stories to our kids, one of the books that we had as bedtime stories was a book called The Giving Tree. And it's always stuck in me. Uh, those of you who like bedtime stories, you should get that book for your kids. It's about a tree that it started off as a seed, then became a little plant. Then as it became a plant, it started to have fruit. But it, as it got bigger, it found that people were just plucking things off it. Plant, I mean, fruit, people pluck off it. It got bigger, people pluck its trees. It got bigger, but it said, okay, I'm just going to give. I'm just going to give. I'm going to give. I'm going to give. Finally, it gets really big. No more, no more fruit to be had, just branches. People start cutting off the branches. Then people cut, cutting off more and more for firewood. Ultimately, all that's left is the stump of the tree. Okay? But even then, the tree says, you know what? Now this is a place where people can sit on. So many generations of people died, uh, as the book goes, to, the story goes on to tell, but people would come and still sit on the trunk of that tree. All that was left of the tree was the trunk. But even in that final form, it was given. Now, I thought that's a beautiful story of life. In some sense, imagine if our entire life could be about serving and encouraging and serving and encouraging beautiful things. Okay, number eight. I will always be careful my words and build on building a seven, seek to be an encourager. To me, what's beautiful about 1 Corinthians 14, where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, one of the great gifts it says, it says is, I wish that all of you would prophesy. And when we think of prophecy, we think about foretelling the future. Okay? That's what more people think. Oh, I prophesied on you, which means I'm going to tell you what you're going to do in the future. Actually, if you look at the definition of, in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, 2, and 3, it talks about being an encourager and an exhorter. Okay? Uh, and it, it, that's what we need to be able to do. And if you can do those simple things about being an encourager, you're prophesying. All of us can be an encourager. I don't have time to show this video, but you've all seen this video of the Brownlee brothers. And it means a beautiful picture. When I first saw this, I think it was my brother Sandeep who introduced me to this video. I thought this is a picture of the, the Christian walk, certainly. You know, often there's another Christian brother who wants to come to me. There have been countless brothers in my life from my teenagers who come alongside me. Sadly, some of those brothers who were impactful to me in my teenagers are not even in the church anymore. Some of them, are not, I don't know if they're Christians. But they walked with me and encouraged me as a teenager in my 20s, in my 30s. Now many of them are walking with me in my 50s. I have to do the same to somebody else. But imagine if you could be like this in the workplace too, where you could be an encourager to someone else. Um, I often joke that my title, I'm the CEO of Koisli. I need to be the chief encouraging officer of the company, the chief encouragement officer of the company. And that's a good, you come into work and you're looking for people to encourage. Okay, number nine, I will seek to make the godly my heroes, seeking their counsel frequently. So I talked about going to my brothers, Santosh, Sandeep, and Sunil. I often ask for their advice. How should I do this? What do you think about that? Now they are my peers. They're, they're walking ahead of me often in the, in, in the walk with the Lord. I ask my dad. I ask others. It does, there's no respecter of age. Seek those who are godly. You can ask them to pray for you. What do you think I should do here? Well, always look for those who have walked with the Lord and make them your heroes. Many of them will be examples like I started my discussion with Daniel and Joseph and Job and uh, Mueller or, uh, and, and Eric Little and so on and so forth or Amy Carmichael. But many of them will be walking with you day to day. And number 10, probably the most important, brothers and sisters is probably a good one to end on. Always be on fire for God. I don't know. Maybe it's the way I'm born because I'm Zach Poon and son. I have not known any other gear in my life than to go fast and to go passionately. I think my dad is that way. Maybe I, I inherited it from him. 
So when people know me in the workplace, they're like, man, you're always on fire. You're always passionate. You always want to go win. I said, yeah, you know, that maybe is part of who I am. But I want internally for people to know that's good to be on fire. I'm very, you know, aggressive and want to win. People who work with me in the workplace know I want to beat the competition. I want to win. That's okay. But the more important fire is to be on fire for God. And then, of course, if the fire in God allows you to be excited and to be passionate about your work and to do well in the workplace, that's great. But don't be on fire for the workplace to beat the competition and win and to get to number one in market share, whatever it is, but not be on fire for God. Okay, that's that to me is not being a Daniel. But if the Lord can give you a fire for God and to be a change agent in your home, in the church, that can also influence you. One of the things that's been a tremendous inspiration to me in all the jobs that I've God's given me wisdom to be a change agent, to take something, you know, that's been uh, sort of a quasi successful strategy and turbocharge it. Uh, I've been blessed with ideas, both at Cohesity, VMware, and SAP, the last three jobs I've had. But I've always told myself when people say, oh, that was incredible, the way you've done this. I tell myself, Lord, what's more important, that success there, or is it being on fire for you uh, in, in my godly life? That's more important. Because none of the successes that we have, brothers and sisters, on this earth will last. What will last is being on fire for God. And the character we leave behind, if we have left back a generation that's on fire for God and our children, okay, that's the most important thing. None of the, the successes we have in this workplace matter at all. And I will tell you here, if you don't have successes, many of you are struggling, maybe we're looking for a job, uh, and you look at someone in my career and say, oh, I'm never going to be, that doesn't matter. If you can be a, a, a brother in the church, it doesn't matter what your jo job is. and um, the Lord will provide for you. Uh, when you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. 